Not long ago, I, uh, I talked with Neil Armstrong about, well, basically the dream that will climax with Apollo 11. Uh, you're supposed to be, and you are a pilot, not uh, a philosopher, but uh, you are going to be the first man to land on the moon. You must have thought well beyond the technical, purely scientific aspects of this mission. So I want to ask you really a kind of an impossible question, but you're the man to give the answers. What do you think this mission will tell us about, uh, about man? If we are successfully able to execute a touchdown and return, it's going to give us an unmeasurable amount of confidence. I think that's probably the greatest result of the flight. It's going to assure those, those people who have been spending uh, long hours late at night for many years in the computer labs across the street and in the simulations uh, over in the other building and in the program offices that uh, the, the almost staggering technical job that they tackled is in fact possible for, for man to conquer. And uh, given that confidence, uh, we will then be in a much better position to accurately judge what we should tackle in the future. It, it won't be marred by a lack of understanding of what can and can't be done. It can be judged on its values. Do you think it might help us to uh, maybe solve some of our uh, less exotic problems here at home, on Earth? Well, I certainly hope that uh, that we would take the, the more successful uh, approaches that have been used in this kind of a uh, program and find ways to apply those approaches to to other problems. I, uh, I don't necessarily agree that uh, just because these people have been in this in this uh, approach have been successful that uh, we uh, should uh, take their resources away from them and give them to, s to some other people who have been less successful in their endeavors. I get the impression you think we might be able to do both. Well, I certainly think we can. We're a great country. Uh, we have a lot of abilities, and uh, when we direct our efforts uh, toward an understood goal, we, uh, we usually solve the problems. You know, I think I was wrong in putting that question to him in the, in the way I phrased it. Uh, he is a philosopher, too, as well as a pilot. He's a young man who... Uh, means what he says and says what he means. We're back in mission control now to see if we can't get some more communication. Houston, Columbia, my uh, disk is reading 4.9 and X, or 5.0 make it, and uh, EMS uh, 105.4, over. Roger, copy, Columbia, Columbia. looks good to us, over. We should have confirmation of the separation burn momentarily. Colin said a few seconds ago to Armstrong and Aldrin, you've got a fine-looking flying machine there, meaning he'd go into the Houston, cell. we'd like you to terminate average G, over. We're waiting now to get confirmation of this separation burn. Right, Frank. A quiet time there. Uh, the burn should just have happened. They'll still be in the visual sight of one another, though, won't they? Right. They'll stay in visual sight for quite some time. Uh, as they slowly drift apart, Collins does a small reaction control, reaction control system thruster burn with Columbia's thrusters, slowly pulls away and watches Eagle 
Indeed, he can see Eagle uh, all the way down, almost to landing. You'll see it This is Apollo Control. That uh, separation maneuver was performed as scheduled, um, giving the uh, command module a, a delta V of about 2.5 feet per second, uh, which should give a separation to the two vehicles of about uh, 1,100 feet at uh, the beginning of the descent orbit insertion maneuver. This is Frank Reynolds with Jules Bergman at ABC Space Headquarters in New York. Thought you tell you we should tell you what uh, Armstrong uh, radioed to Mike Collins as he moved away in Columbia after the uh, separation burn. He said, "You're going right down US one, Mike." And Collins moved away, and now they are flying in tandem, so to speak, until the time comes for the DOI or the descent orbit initiation when they will start down in Eagle toward the surface of the moon, and Mike Collins in Columbia continues, of course, to orbit around a sort of a watchful mother hen to watch every, every move they make in the event they encounter any difficulty on the way down. He does have the capability to go to a certain point, a certain point, and uh, try to rescue them. And of course, he'll be very happy to see them come back when they crawl through that tunnel again. Late tomorrow get, afternoon. He can get pretty low, Frank. Well, how, how far down can he go? He well, said the other day about 10 miles, didn't he? It varies a little bit, but uh, Collins has apparently rehearsed the fine art of rescue uh, in abort modes to the point where he can actually get the Columbia command module down to 20 or 25,000 feet above the moon's surface if he has to in the unlikely event that all the lunar module's engines failed and uh, Armstrong and Aldrin couldn't abort by themselves to get back up to the Columbia. So Collins can get down within five miles of the moon's surface. Within five miles? That's pretty surface. low. It sure is. He's at about 69 or 70 now. I remember, I think you were there when we, I talked to Mike that day, and Mike's principal concern was uh, no one is sure how high some of those craters, uh, how low some of the craters are, and how high uh -huh. many of the mountains are on the moon's surface. And you're coming along, it's like, it's like avoiding television towers and buildings and an airplane coming in in a rainstorm. You've got to be darn sure what's going on. So that's one big thing he's worried about. Yes, you like trying to land at, uh, I'll say, one of New York's airports without knowing very much about uh, how the buildings were around New York. <laughs>